All right, so welcome back to part three. And the question is, did it work? So our first question, is the prediction better than nothing? So are all three variables significant, so to speak? So is the overall model um, better than no prediction? Yes. So we'll see how we see that. So I ran a summary on my final model because I didn't do anything special for data screening after I removed outliers. And what it does is it tells you out here, the um, model you ran tells me the coefficients, but that's the second question. So for the first question, I wanna come down here to these last lines and look at the overall model. So this tells me my multiple R squared, which is really great. So I got 0 0.32, that would normally be considered large. And then tells me the F statistic. Okay, the F statistic here has two degrees of freedom, one based on the number of predictors. Okay. So it's technically four, the, um, <clears throat> four. Okay, I know I've only got three, but check out here, there's also an intercept. So B0, B1, B2, B3. But remember degrees of freedom is the number of things that are free to vary. It's usually n minus one. So it's four intercept, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, minus one. So it's three. Okay. I think it's in a, it's easy to think, oh, it's the number of predictors here. It's K basically, but it's all, it is actually the number of sort of things in the equation minus one. Okay. And you have to remember the intercept is in the equation. Now, our second degree of freedom is based on the sample size, so it's n minus k minus one. Okay, so n sample size minus three minus one. Okay, and this is on our data set that has removed the outliers. Now, is 39, which is a ratio of signal to noise, so the amount of, va of variance we're predicting in y to the amount of error that we have. Okay, it's not totally that simple, but that's the basic idea of like, how much I'm predicting Y to how much noise is left. <laughs> um, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, better than having just Y in the equation, right? So having just the Y intercept. And if we use P less than 0.05 as our traditional alpha, yeah. Now one thing, uh, now this is in APA style. So, you know, that, won't impress your boss, but if you're wanting to print this out in traditional APA style, might I recommend the Papaya Library? It is fantastic. It makes my heart happy. It's um, preparing APA journal articles, basically, and um, can be installed directly from GitHub, soon to be in Cran, I hope. And what it has is this is a fantastic function called APA print. And so you take in the model that you are interested in. So that's our model two, run it through APA print, and that saves it in a lot of different cool formats. But the one we're interested in is full result, dollar sign model fit. Now, if I printed this in any other format than slides, this would actually print pretty nicely. Okay. Um, where this will say, okay, our, our squared value Okay, it's 0.32. It actually gives you a confidence interval on your effect size. Okay, a 90% confidence interval. Okay, this, um, I think you can change this, but not unusual to see a 90% confidence interval, even though we've done kind of 95%, right? Uh, our alpha is 0.05. Okay. And then it gives you the F statistic returned back in APA style. Okay. And I also really like, love this kind of side of putting the effect size first because I think if you look at most journal articles, the effect size is second, but I'm a big fan of effect sizes. So let's put it first, why not? Okay. But the main criteria here is that we can tell that our R squared is better than zero. Okay. And our significance test says that the signal to noise ratio implies that there's enough evidence to reject the null, right? It implies the null is very unlikely. So we reject that null and we say, yeah, we can predict. But which one is it? <laughs> right. Which one is doing the prediction? Are they all predicting? Is one of them predicting? Does one of them work? One of them doesn't? What, what happens? And um, here I actually told it to print properly and not just as output in my slides. And so that's what it might look like when it prints. 
Now to think about just the predictors, what we could still run that summary. I don't actually have to run it twice. I just wanted to kind of emphasize that it's two different steps. We come down here to coefficients. Okay. Now the coefficients here, the first row would be our equation. So we'd say y equals 54.82 minus the influence of the pill. Okay, so that's negative. So as meaning goes up, depression goes down. That's in the predicted direction, cool. Controlling for everything else. But then our audit score, right, which is our alcohol use is actually also negative. <laughs> so as alcohol use goes up, depression goes down, controlling for everything else, which is sort of interesting. Okay. So for every one unit increase in alcohol, okay, we get negative 0.08 decreases in the CSD. Now that's not a whole lot. Okay. Now for the DAS, this is our drug scale. What we see is that one's positive. So as drug use increases, depression also increases. But that's just interpreting this coefficient. Okay. And even though this one is larger than this one, they're in very different scales. So what I do is I convert them all to T values okay, by basically dividing across. So this is our model. Here's our standard error for that estimate. So it's signal to noise. The T value here is literally this one divided by that one. And once we convert controlling for all these differences in scales, um, now we can kind of see that our signal to noise ratio is very high for the pills, 10 to one. Okay. And they, these are very low. Okay, they're basically one to one. Remember the one to one ratio means you can't tell the difference between signal and noise. And so we see out here that this one would be considered significant at P less than 0.05. These other two would not. So yes, our model predicts overall, but it's really the only meaning that is helpful here. Okay, these other two variables are not predictive. And that's why you have two separate questions. Okay. Doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes they're all predictive. Sometimes in weird scenarios, none of them are predictive. Okay. Very strange scenario. <laughs> Um, but that happens when you have a, like a lot of predictors that all add very small contributions. So total, it's, it's predictive, but not individually. Okay. And so we can actually get those from our saved output very nicely. Okay, so we do full result pill total, and it prints out the coefficient, its confidence interval, and its T value. And so remember I said you report degrees of freedom, the single degrees of freedom with T. And often people just don't know where to find that number, but it's our second degree of freedom for F. And so you can tell if people are doing sneaky things in their reports if they, uh, if they don't match. <laughs> so if their overall statistic doesn't match the individual one, something weird has happened. But one reason I love papaya is because I didn't have to do anything real. I didn't have to think about that and I just told it to print and it's printed them all out. And then we can also get them to print in like, if you do it in the document rather than as part of the code, right? Um, we can see each of them kind of nicely printed. Okay. It even uh, controls for the number of decimal points you're supposed to use. So in P you're supposed to use three and everything else is two. And to show you kind of like what, what why they look different on my slides here. Whoa, too much, there we go. Let's scroll down a little bit. What I did was here, I told it to print inside a code block. So it printed code block style. Here, I've told it to print outside in the like slide version. And the simple difference is that this code block stuff will print as if it's printing in the console. So it's got the three ticks. If you use one tick and a little R here, saying you're still running R code, this isn't Python or something um, bash or something different print the same thing. Now this is going to interpret as printing sort of inline text, okay, versus code style. And that's really how, why this one looks <clears throat> like code and this one looks like pretty formatted text, okay. And the little dollar signs here are something that's interpreted as um, italics, right. This double thing here is to make sure to actually percent, print the percent sign that kind of stuff. Okay. All right, two concerns. What 
if I wanted to use beta, because these are very different scales. So maybe I wanted to compare those predictors directly. Now I already know that one of them is significant and the other ones aren't. So that should also be reflected in the beta. And what about effect size? So let's grab those things. Now beta we could do with the quant psi package. It's really great because um, it's simple. So you just do lm.beta and it prints out all of your coefficients in z-score format. And now we can really see that even though these two, let me back up, had very different um, numbers. So 0 0.08, 0 0.57. Okay. It looks like maybe the drug one is, is better for some reason. Okay. But once I standardize those and have them in the same scale, it's clear they're actually very close to each other, okay, prediction wise and close to zero. And the pill is much stronger. So the, the significance values will reflect kind of here, but remember, don't say more significant, don't do that. Um, but it, it'll give you the same answer. Okay. Now effect size, I wanna go back and highlight something we talked about in the last lecture and really kind of hopefully like solidify these differences between RR, SR and PR. So remember that R is our multiple correlation, big R, when we're not talking about the language. And it's basically the overlap in Y and used for our overall model. Okay, and I could square it to get my effect size. So conceptually here, let's say we have two independent variables and I have labeled everything, this F is for this little spot right here. Okay, I've labeled all of the potential spots on my Venn diagram with some letters here. So IV1, the variance in IV1 is A, B, E, and F. Okay, the variance in IV2, C, B, F, and G. The dependent variable is A, B, C, D. Okay. And so we're trying to see how much variance in the dependent variable can I account for by all of my predictors? And that is the overlap in my predictors and the DV. So what the formula is, is the signal to, signal to everything. So we use ABC, okay. that is the variance that's accounted for by the predictors, divided by all of the variance in the DV. Okay. And this is how we interpret that idea of variance accounted for. So there's all this variance in the DV, and ABC is what I can predict. Okay. So I'm telling you that I have 32% total of the variance between my three variables. Um, in this case, there's only two, two of them here, but um, you know we would do all three of them for our example. And this is why you don't want multicollinearity because if B is very large, you're not getting a whole lot of extra by including both of them. Okay, so we want the overlap between variables to be small so that they can each take up a chunk of the DV variance. Because that's the important part here. So we're really trying to predict this DV. Okay, so that's R and R squared. SR, our semi-partial correlation that last week was like, what is this variable? Why is it? It's a lot easier to interpret a regression because you force one of them to be the one. Okay, remember we talked about correlations. It's kind of like, well, we're gonna take out the variance for this one, but not that one. And it can be very confusing. And so the interpretation in a regression analysis is that it's the unique contribution of each IV to R squared for those IVs. Okay. Now SR values can add up. So people like these because it tells you how much unique variance you're adding. Okay, so what do we mean by unique variance? So it's the increase in proportion of variance explained in Y when X is added to the equation. So for IV1, the unique variance that IV1 does all by itself is A. Okay. B is overlapped, so it doesn't count. The unique variance for IV2 all by itself is C. B doesn't count. Okay. B only counts towards R now. So that formula could be A divided by the total amount of variance in the uh, dependent variable. Okay. That's a lot easier to interpret. And if we calculated the SR squareds for both, or the SR, we'd still have to square it. But if we calculate the semi-partial correlation for both of these, you could then 
um, subtract. So you could take R squared minus each SR and figure out the total overlapping variance. Okay. Um, so they do kind of, they can't, they won't add up to R because sometimes the variance doesn't count. Like B never gets to get counted in an SR, but they at least add up less than R. And this will be an important point in just a second. And so PR, which is my favorite, is the proportion of variance in Y not explained by other predictors, but just X. Okay. And so that idea is, um, is removing all of the other variants. So let me back up. So on our SR squared one, we removed the overlap between the X's. So we remove B. In PR, what we do is remove all of the overlapping variants. So remove B and C. Take it out. So anything accounted for by other predictors doesn't count. And so it's the proportion of unique variance added okay, divided by what's left. So it's the unique variance predicted after accounting for everything else. And so I th hopefully these diagrams have helped solidify these kind of differences. Okay. Naturally, PR is always greater than SR because it's essentially the same formula. So it's A over A plus D for PR, if you back up here. And we get A over everything. So mathematically, PR will always be greater than SR unless it's zero because the denominator for PR is smaller or reduced. Okay. Now, the problem with PR that people have here is that they, because their denominators are all different, right? So PR for this other one would be C over C plus D. Okay. Um, that's a different denominator than. A over A plus D, so you can't add these up. So I've had folks when I've looked, reviewed papers who are like, well, your numbers are all wrong because your effect sizes add up to more than your R squared. And then I have to like pull out my book and cite how this mathematically works. Um, so people like SR because it doesn't have that problem, <laughs> right? It tells you about unique contributions using the same denominator as R squared. Uh, people like PR because it talks about the unique contribution to what's left and it seems larger. Um, so just with a warning with PR, don't expect these to add up. They can add up to less or they can actually add up to more than R squared. So you can't add them. Okay, in SR, you can add them and it should be equal to or less than R squared because it has the same denominator. PR does not have the same denominator for any of them. So they don't really add up in any particular way. Just a warning. Real life experience. Now, how can we calculate those? Well, um, <clears throat> we could add these to our reports. So I kind of I calculated them and then just may, kind of manually typed them. So let's go look at how that looks. Okay, I just typed them in here at the end by hand, and I could get fancier here, but um, this is pretty easy. And what I did to calculate these is I could use PCOR, okay. um, which we did in the last video. Okay. And so I just pulled them directly. Now, these numbers are based on the incorrect analysis I did without changing the right data set. So the numbers are slightly different here, but very close. So this number should actually be 0 0.30 to match the CESD here correlated with the pill after accounting for everything else. And the audit is less than 0.01, that's still accurate. And then the DAS is still, um, is less than 0.01 as well. Okay, so we wanna look at the, the column with the Y variable and then just match it to the appropriate X variable. Okay, and if I zoom out, I think that table looks much nicer. So this first one should be 0 0.30 and then less than 0.01 and less maybe equals 0.01. No, the rounding is bad less than 0.01 for both of these. Okay. So no matter if you use beta or RFX sizes, the pattern is still the same. Important, not important, not important. Okay. All right, and I'll fix those numbers here. So let's do one more example for this lecture and talk about hierarchical regression. Okay. And hierarchical, the, the one we just did was simultaneous regression. Hierarchical regressions where we run things in steps. Okay. And so we might put in our known predictors based on past research first, use them as a control or an adjuster, 
and then add new variables. Okay. Those new variables are entered in a second step. And now I can look at the unique predictive influence of that new variable because the other ones are held constant. That is almost what PR squared answers, but this is a slightly different way to do it. Okay. And with hierarchical regression, usually there's some sort of a priori or prior to the analysis decision on which ones go first and which ones go second. Okay. If you have no real decisions and you just want to know the mathematically which ones are the best, you could use stepwise regression. But there, that's based on the mathematical properties of this exact sample, which may or may not generalize or replicate to other samples. So what question is different here? Like, how is this different than what we just did? Well, it still answers this question of, is my overall model important, significant? Okay. But then adds a new question that we can ask, which is, is the addition of each step significant? Okay. So is just this variable or this set of variables greater than, you know, adding greater than zero, basically. So you're essentially testing if the change in R squared is different from zero. And then the last question stays the same, are the individual predictors significant? So that middle one is the new one. We use this when I want to control for something I know influences the variables, so confound or, or correlated covariates. Okay. When I want to see the incremental value of these different variables, so if I use this one first, how much does this next one add? Okay. Or when I want to discuss variables as a set. Okay. And that might happen when I have a bunch of super predicted, pre, uh, bleh, bleh, super correlated variables. And I know that they're super correlated, so I'm just going to treat them all as one set. I'm still going to lose a little bit of power by including them all, but this can be a way to deal with multicollinearity. So we're going to add one more wrinkle to this example, which is something that I think people struggle with interpreting and doing, and that's categorical predictors and regression. Okay, so far, everything that we have used has been continuous. And so it's easy to think about for every one unit increase in X, we get, you know, B unit increases or decreases in Y. But if I have groups variables, what do I do? There are a lot of options. We're going to specifically talk about dummy coding. And um, this is, specific, you know, this particular problem is when variables are nominal, not binary. Okay, so we have two or more than two categories. If you only have two categories, throw it in and this will be fine. If you have more than two categories, throw it in and let's see what happens. Okay. So all types of regression can handle categorical predictors. This is not specific to hierarchical regression. This is just where I put this example. Okay, so simultaneous regression can handle categoricals. And we're gonna use dummy coding to convert our our sort of factor variable into something I can work with. Okay. And there are several forms of what's called effects coding. So I've included a link here to one of the best websites that explains this idea. But I just wanted to, to note, we're going to focus on dummy coding specifically. And what that does is it takes uh, the categories and creates these like very specific control groups. So I can't compare all of them at once. I can't make one predictor that tells me everything I wanna know about the groups. What I do instead is make a bunch of pairwise comparisons. Okay, this actually amounts to independent t-tests, which we'll get to in a couple, uh, two weeks, two weeks. <laughs> so uh, what I do is I say, okay, I'm gonna pick one of these groups to be my control group. Okay. It doesn't literally have to be a control group. It's just the comparison group. And then I'm gonna compare everybody to that. And so we're, what we do is we take a variable that's nominal and convert it into something that creates small binary comparisons. So let's look at that in, in practice here with my um, copied Excel table <laughs> from Word, uh, from PowerPoint. But how do I dummy code? Well, R actually does this for you. 
<laughs> it's so great. And it'll take a factored variable to create essentially this. This is automatic, this is the default. So let's say for this example from the textbook, we have no treatment, which is a literal control group, but no treatment. Placebo, Paxil, Effexor, and just telling somebody to cheer up. What it will do is take these categories, there's five, and create me categories minus one for new variables. Those four variables are everything compared to the control condition. Okay, whatever makes the control condition. The automatic control condition is whichever one is first in the like, if you print out a table, whichever one's first. So we would have to specifically order them in this, in this order to make no treatment first. And it essentially creates what's uh, this kind of contrast matrix here where um, the one represents who's being compared to the control group. Okay. So the control group is the one who gets all zeros. The one here implies that this particular variable is placebo versus no treatment. Because it's the one compared to the, con to the all zero group. Okay. You don't actually see any of this. I'm just trying to explain what's happening in the background. Then our Paxil versus the dummy group. Um, I'm oh, sorry, the no treatment group, Effexor versus no treatment, and cheer up versus no treatment. So effectively, it creates new columns in the background to, do, to create this math that um, are uh, got individual barcodes, so to speak. So I've always thought about this as a sort of like, it's not binary coding, but it's close, <laughs> okay? Um, where the, com the comparison group becomes the all zero group then the placebo, the next group becomes one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so this section is very similar to what's called one hot coding, if you're familiar. What people always want to have happen is to have dummy five, which is the no treatment group. So essentially you get one dummy group for each variable, for each one dummy variable for each group. Okay, that is not how it works because you have to be testing something. I can't just tell, does this group predict the variable? And it's like, compared to what? Okay. So in the predictor, I have to have some sort of variance. Okay. Predictors have to have variance. It doesn't work. Okay. And so I can't have a predictor as just one group. I have to say, okay, does this, can I predict the difference between right? Uh, you know, whatever the DV is here, um, you know, considering I have these two groups. Okay. And so effectively we're comparing if there are group differences. So anytime you have a binary variable in a, in a regression analysis, you are asking, does group one and group two, or do, do group one and group two have different dependent variable, dependent variable scores? This is an independent t-test that asks if the group means are different. Okay. An independent t-test normally is framed as, uh, does group one and group two have different means? Okay. I don't know what's with my do variable tonight. Um, but that is actually a regression question too. Can I predict my dependent variable from these groups? Right. And the best prediction for each group is the mean. And so our coefficient is the difference in means controlling for everything else. That's the key word here, controlling for everything else. You can't subtract the means directly, but I'll show you here in a second how to get that component. Okay. So remember the variables that you'll see in the output are a comparison of groups to each other because you have to have some variance there. There has to be a one and a zero. You can't just use the group. It won't work. There's no variance there. It just says, I am the group. Okay. And so we're comparing groups to each other on the DV. And that is what dummy coding is. Now, contrast coding is different. There are different effects codings where I can compare everybody to um, uh, all the groups to the control group or this group versus every other group. There are other ways to do this. But what we're saying is we're picking one group and comparing everybody to that one group. And then your question hopefully is, well, what if I want to compare everybody to group four as well? You recode what group is the comparison group and run it again. 
So our IVs in this equation are the family history of depression, which we're gonna use as our control variable. A treatment, which you just saw was our categorical variable of five groups. And the DV is your rating of depression after treatment. So we've got our data frame of treatment here. Um, this is our <clears throat> categorical variable, our family history and after. Okay, we're gonna skip data screening, but you would do it in the exact same way okay, as we've already done. And um, I wanna show you how to convert because we imported here a SPSS file. See, that's why it's got all this extra stuff in here. Let's convert that into a, a variable we can use because right now it's coded as a number. And I could tell what the groups are, but I need it to not be a number because otherwise it will treat it as continuous and that's no good because this is a categorical variable. Okay. So if you print out the attributes, let's say you get an SPSS file from somebody, from some friend who has not learned about the glories of open, open, <laughs> open source, you can say, okay, fine, I'll take your data and I'll make it useful. So using the attributes here, I can see the labels and what number they represent. So zero represents no treatment, one equals Paxil, uh, placebo, sorry, two equals Paxil, three equals Fexor. If I zoomed out, this would print a little bit nicer. Okay, then it's hard to read. And what we wanna do is just convert that variable into a real factor. So convert. Levels are zero to four, because that's what's in the data, the numbers, and then here are my labels. Okay. Make sure you factor your variable, okay. um, or the variable's already factored, or at least a character, but it's gonna work better if you factor it. Okay. Now, let's see what happens. The data screening should be done on the last step. I skipped the data screening, but we're gonna run multiple steps you wanna screen on the very last step okay? because you wanna know if a person is an outlier or you have problems with the residuals on all of the predictors. So you do data screening on the last step and then you go back and run you know, step one, step two, step three. Okay. So what we're gonna do in model one here is control for family history. So we know that family history will predict your depression. <laughs> it's well, um, well known. And then add if our um, uh, treatment variable predicts above and beyond that. Okay. So first question, is my overall model significant? Well, I printed it out here nicely for us, but let's come down here and look at the model. So I'm gonna say my after is approximated by my family history. Okay, on my data screens data, pretend for me. Okay. Let's look at our summary. So we would roll down here to the bottom Okay, one in 48 degrees of freedom. So we don't have a whole bunch of people in this data set. Okay. And uh, the predictor, there's only one degree of freedom here because we have the intercept in the family history, minus one, so one. But it is significant. Okay. And I have an R squared value of 15%. So that's a good chunk of their depression scores are predicted by family history of depression. Okay. So yes. The second question is which predictor is important? Well, there's only one. So they'll actually match. This is one way you can tell you're doing it right, <laughs> is they'll match. Uh, family history is a significant predictor, right? Um, the T's values match here. Uh, if we were, 2.92, okay. I wanna prove something. So I said earlier that F is T squared. Right, and that's why you can't do a one-tailed test because they're all values are all squared. So if I took my T value, 2.92, if I did the whole thing, this would be um, exactly the same. But if I just square that, I'd get 8.5. Okay, check it out, 8.5. So these two things actually tell me the exact same thing because when you only have one predictor, the overall model question is the individual predictor question. Okay. And so that's just proof that these two things are the same. And this is actually a question of correlation. So does it predict? Yep. Now let's add our categorical variable set. Okay. It's adding one predict, it's adding one like set of predictors. So I like to put it in its own step so I can tell all together how well does my treatment variable work. Okay. And then look at each pairwise comparison. 
And this is why hierarchical regression is really useful. So model two examines the addition of this treatment category as a set, because I got four new variables, even though it's one like conceptual variable. And don't take out the other variables. We are adding as we go. This is a hierarchical regression. We're stepping down, like adding them. So one thing the students like to, to do is they just switch them out. No, 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 add. You're adding to your equation. Now, let's scroll down. And I can tell that my overall model is significant. But that just tells me that everything all together, all of these pieces, family history and treatment are important. It doesn't tell me if that's still just family history or is that also because treatment is useful. Now, a quick glance at my R squared tells me it's probably that both of them are useful, but you know, I'm more interested in the change between models. Okay. So what if the first model is significant and then that second model is actually not any better, but overall it could still be significant just because the first model was. And I've had this happen plenty of times. Well, the second model doesn't really add anything, but the first model was so strong that overall it still looks good. So we don't really wanna test the overall model here. What we wanna do is test the change between models. Okay. And this is one confusing thing about base R is that the ANOVA function tests the difference between models. It doesn't actually run an ANOVA. Okay. So what it does is it'll, uh, It'll tell me the sort of addition of, of the, the variables in the second model if that is better than nothing. Okay. So is the R squared change greater than zero? Okay. Right. And we would report it this way. So saying change, so delta here means change, and report the statistics you're about to look at and say yes. The addition of this entire treatment set actually added 27% of the variance. So we went from 15% to 40 something percent, and that change is 27. And I get that number by subtracting. <laughs> okay. So let's see here. So it shows me the degrees of freedom for the original model, it shows me the new model, it says the difference in degrees of freedom is four. So that's what happens here. Okay. The residual degrees of freedom just is. Okay. And the change in the sum of squares or the change in prediction that F ratio of signal to noise in the change is five basically. And that represents P less than 0.05 in this example. To get this number, what I did was I took my 15 from before. Okay, I said, okay, 40.415 minus 0.15. Okay. And if you round that rounds up to 0.27. Okay. So my overall change is important. Now comes the question of which groups are different. Okay. So it's, we're comparing the control group to the coded group. And I use a coded word. I don't have a good other word here. If you've got one, I'll take it. But the group that is the comparison point. So the control group, whoever is the lowest one, so our no treatment group, compared to our coded group. Okay. And I'm gonna show you a better way to do this in just a second, but practically what those B values mean is that the, if the B value is negative, the coded group is lower because the slope is going down from the control group to the coded group. If the number is positive, the coded group is higher because it's going from the control group to the coded group. Okay. That's very confusing. We'll look at how we can just literally look at the means in a minute. Okay. Our B value represents a dis difference in means, but here's the key. You can't just use T apply. Now that you're comfortable with T apply, right? I tell you, you can't use it <laughs> because it's controlling for everything else. So it's the difference in the mean scores after control for all these other comparisons and family history. So you can't just straight calculate the means from the data because it doesn't, you know, sort of adjust for the fact that there are all these other variables in the equation. So we'll look at how we can get the adjusted means, you know, controlling for everything else. Okay. So we're gonna use EM means to do that. It is a great package and it's called the estimated marginal means are the means for each group given the other predictors in the model. That's really handy. Like 
here's what the scores are for these groups kind of controlling for everything else. This is very similar to an ANCOVA, if you're familiar with that term, where we're actually comparing groups controlling for a continuous variable. Now let's look at the actual coefficients here. Okay. So I told it to reprint coefficients and it didn't print the code for some reason. I probably forgot. This is a set of slides that have just been insane. Um, I did want to print this. So we do want to look at the code. Just read in it. All right. Okay, did this. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna rerun the summary and let's just talk about them before we get down here to marginal means. So when we're gonna kind of ignore this variable because we've already talked about it and thought about it, but this now with with the treatment in the equation, it's still important predictor. Okay, it's less than 0.05. And then we have our four comparisons. So placebo and no treatment are different somehow. Okay. They're different by four points and that's significant. Placebo and Paxil are no different. Okay. Placebo, I'm sorry, not placebo, no treatment and placebo are different. No treatment and Paxil are not different. No treatment and effects are, are different. Okay. No treatment versus cheer up are different. Now, if I wanted to know effects or versus cheer up, I would have to recode. So take my factor variable, reorder them, and rerun my analysis. Now, to make this whole thing easier, like, okay, there are four points different. Okay, it's negative, so that means that score is less. Like, that's too much mental work. So let's use EM means because it's also beautifully easy. And so you say, give me the estimated marginal means on model two, we put in our, our model that has the categorical variable and tell it the name of the variable. Okay, the name of the variable is treatment and it spits them out, it's so beautiful, beautiful. Right, so it says, okay, well the no treatment marginal mean is 15.8. Okay, the placebo group is 11.7. Now do that math, 15 minus 11 is the four points here. Okay. That might be different than your T apply and so this is the score that is based, that's getting that, where that B value is coming from. And that's one reason I love this package. Okay. It does calculate the means based, you know, controlling for everything else. All right, so what we've got here is our no treatment versus our placebo is significance. What's happening? Okay, their scores are going down. So this is the placebo effect where people are getting better just because they think they should be getting better. Uh, no treatment versus Paxil, they're not, it's not working. Okay, they're not getting any better than no treatment. Uh, no treatment versus effects or they are getting better, okay. Um, but it's probably a small effect size. Okay. And then our no treatment versus cheer up, those people are getting the best, so to speak. Okay. This will also agree where their confidence intervals won't overlap. So all these things kind of converge. And that's how we can interpret it. Now I can look at the actual scores and think these are depression scores. We want them to be low. So the lower score is better. So no treatment, the cheer up group is doing much better. Because okay, it's a fake made up example from a clinical psychologist. So uh, this is from the Andy field. Okay. Now I can't use P core anymore because this is a categorical variable. I could create this dummy coding myself and then use PCORE, but then that's, that can be confusing. You wanna make sure you're doing it the exact same way. So it's actually a formula for um, calculating PR squared. So this is for PR from um, T values directly. And so this is what I will use if I have categorical variables because it can be difficult to make sure I'm matching my dummy coding in the same way. So we take our, we save our model summary. We grab all of our T values. So model summary dollar sign coefficients gives me that coefficients table. And the third column over is T. So what that's doing is it's grabbing this table and then one, two, three, third column over is T. Okay. Cause this is actually the row name. So people sometimes think it's four. This is the third column, one, two, three. Okay. 
So grab those T values, grab my residual degrees of freedom. Okay, so our degrees of freedom for T. So this grabs at 44. Back up one more time here, it grabs this one. Okay. I'm gonna just do the math, T squared divided by T squared plus degrees of freedom. And now we've got our, these are PR squared. Okay, and this is what I mean they don't add up to R squared. <laughs> because we're already over one here and that doesn't work. But remember, they all have different denominators. So I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. Ignore the intercept. That's not what we want. But we could tell family history and while we can see like that that is still contributing a good amount of variance even after accounting for everything else. Okay. Only a little bit of overlap. Um, but the placebo versus no treatment is a large effect. A okay. treatment versus cheer up is the largest effect. So ignore the intercept, but that'll get me my PR squared values kind of quickly, which is difficult with categorical variables. Now you can do that for continuous variables too. It's just that categorical variables present a specific problem using PCOR. Now, the very last thing I want to start really you, uh, talking a lot about is power. Okay. So remember the power is the ability to find the effect when it's there. And we don't often calculate like achieved power that that does come up like I could calculate the power of this test. Okay, the, the probability of me finding an effect if it's there, and it would tell me one because my p value is <laughs> quite low. So what I really want to know is if I were to do this study again, how many participants would I need, given this effect size. Okay. So there is an assumption that this effect size is realistic and generalizes to the larger population. But you know, given this effect size, how many participants did I actually need in my study? Okay. And this can help inform what I can do in later studies. Okay. Now I do think you should probably you take your effect size and cut it in half, because that's more conservative, and that it matches some research that shows that published effect sizes are kind of overrated, um, or overestimated or both. <laughs> Uh, but let's just show you how the power package works. Okay, so the PWR library is fantastic as well. It allows us to calculate power. There's a really great standalone program called G Power that's open source. That's really um, awesome. But you know we're learning R, so let's look at PWR here. And the big thing that we have to do is convert our R squared to what's called an F squared value. Okay. F squared here is a slightly different effect size. It's not, it is not related to the like F statistic that we calculated. It's just a, a different form. It just, we just have to convert, okay? And so the formula for that is R squared divided by one minus R squared. So our R squared value is uh, overall for our models 0.42 basically. Our F squared converted is 0.71. Why are these, why, why do I gotta do this? Well, the power function is based on F squared. Um, and F squared is way more popular in the medical field. But, I mean, they're just different, different ones. <laughs> and so there's a lot of converting between effect sizes in these examples um, because of the way these packages are written. So convert using this formula. And uh, this is my model summary that I saved a minute ago to do my T statistics. And then I'm going to use this function called power.f2.test. Well, there's your f squared. Okay. And this is actually a function I could use for um, nearly any statistic. So it's kind of nice because we can use it in a lot of different ways, but it's really good for regression. Okay. So u here is the degrees of freedom for our model. It's the first value in the F statistic, which we've used very little. <laughs> okay. And so that's actually six um, in our example, I believe. I want to back up. Back up a little more here. Oh, I'm sorry, it's five. Okay. So five degrees of freedom. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six variables, minus one for the intercept here. And so we have five degrees of freedom. But I, uh, oops, sorry, I got excited. I can't be trusted to remember this. So you pull it from your model summary. It's the first degree of freedom. Okay. V is our degrees of freedom for error. This is the number we're actually trying to figure out. How many participants do I have to have? 
And remember that V is calculated as N minus K minus one. So we're gonna figure out an estimated value for V and then kind of work backwards from there. Okay, so we're trying to figure out sample size, which is part of what V is calculating. So we're gonna leave that one blank. So we say null. And that's how we tell the library, this is the one I want. Give me the one that's null. F2 is our converted effect size. SIG level is our alpha value, usually 0.05, because we've been using. Power is our power level. 0.8 is kind of industry standard. Okay, so I want 80% power. That gives us a beta or a type 2 error of 0.2. And so our remember the final sample size here is going to be V plus K plus 1, where K is predictors. So we have five predictors, so V plus 6. And so it's telling me that I only need 19, maybe round up, 20 plus 6, 26 participants total. And we kind of evenly distribute them between groups. So in summary, what have we learned across all these videos? Quite a lot, actually. So we've talked about regression, both simultaneous and hierarchical regression, right? Thinking about the null hypothesis testing steps and, and what every value is telling me. Um, talking about outliers with regression and the differences in data screening, talking about effect sizes. So what's the difference between R squared, PR squared, SR squared, and why are those useful, right? Remembering that that tells us like how important that effect can be. And so some predictors are, aren't significant, but maybe practically very important. And then also categorical predictors in regression using dummy coding. And so um, you can now run almost any type of analysis you're interested in a general linear model, right? Using these squares, we have actually now done t-tests in ANOVA. And so you're like, okay, well then why are you gonna talk about them for two weeks at the end of the semester? We'll show you the other way to do them. But regression is the answer. <laughs> it is the math. T-tests are a special type of regression, so are ANOVAs. And we've actually done both already now. So hopefully hopefully this will like link up in those, in those weeks. And then we ended with power because power can tell me how much I should do next time. So if I run the study again, or if I run a similar study, what might I expect? So how many people do I need? So you're not wasting people's time. Or, you know, if your power tells you, you need 8,000 people, you might think, oh, well, this is not worth doing. Right? So that sums us up for regression. Next week, we're gonna cover uh, mediation and moderation, which are special types of regression before we get to t-test and ANOVA.